Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the class. So, um, um, uh, Joshuan uh, covered uh, the topics around graph neural networks over the last few weeks, uh, but now I'm kind of, uh, I'm back and I'm going to cover uh, uh, for uh, some, of, some of the next topics. So here is what uh, we'll talk today about without any bugs. Uh, we so far talked about graph neural networks and um, how to handle graphs with a single type of relation. And then in the, in the, um, the last lecture, we then talked about heterogeneous graphs and how do you build GNNs for heterogeneous graphs. Um, we talked about the relational GCN, the knowledge graph, um, uh, we talked about the relational GCN in the last graph, so uh, in the last lecture. What are we going to do today? We are going to talk about knowledge graphs, which are these directed graphs with different relation types that usually have no features on nodes um, uh, of, the, of the network. And what we are kind of going to, to talk to today about is kind of an analog of node to vec and deep walk that we, this kind of shallow embeddings that we talked about um, at the beginning uh, of the class uh, and generalize that to, uh, to heterogeneous graphs. That's one way to uh, think of this. And the task we'll be talking about is the embeddings for knowledge graph completion. That's uh, the way to think of this. So last time, <laughs> sorry, 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 okay. So last time we talked about heterogeneous graphs. We talked about uh, graphs with different node types and different relation types. Yes? Our own announcement page. Ignore everything I said so far. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It was the wrong slides. That's why it was in October. That's all. Everything is wrong. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. So, brand new lecture. Breathe in. Look, you guys are the best. You arrived late. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be confused. So, if you are confused, ask them. Okay. <laughs> so, brand new lecture. Start from scratch. Ignore everything I said. Really sorry. Um, going again. So these are the announcements that are good, read them. Um, they've been verified. This is the CS224W machine learning with graphs. Today we are going to talk about knowledge graphs embedding. So the topic is right, okay? So what did we talk about last, um, um, last time? We talked about uh, g how do we generalize graph neural networks to heterogeneous graphs, where we have no edges of different types and we have nodes um, potentially of different types. Okay, um, and we talked about relational GCN, where we learn um, a graph from, um, basically we learn from a graph with multiple relation types, and you, we use different neural network weights for different relation types, right? So we basically took the GNN architecture, but generalized it now so that these message, message passing functions are relation specific, so that we have more expressive power um, when working with heterogeneous graphs. Today, we are going to kind of take this and further generalize it to the notion of knowledge graphs. And let me first tell you what is a knowledge graph and why is it so important and why is it so useful. So knowledge graphs allow you to capture in a graph form, in a relational form, uh, knowledge about entities uh, and their relations. So we are going to capture entities, types, and the relationships between them. So you can think of nodes as entities. And uh, node types are, uh, and these nodes are lab labeled with their types. And then edges between two nodes capture the relationship between the entities. Um, and knowledge graph is an example of a heterogeneous graph. But the reason why we call these things knowledge graphs, because the idea is that we encode our knowledge about a given domain in this type of graphical form. So you can think of this as a knowledge base over which you can reason, over which you can retrieve, and allows you to kind of bring in the knowledge to your machine learning model, okay? So that's the, that's the idea. So what would be one example of a knowledge graph? For example, if you are answering questions, predictions about academia and papers, then, for example, a, a bio, bibliographic network, you can think of it as a knowledge graph, right? You have conferences, papers, titles, year of publications, and authors. And papers have citations to each other. So this is like a schema of this heterogeneous uh, knowledge graph with five different node types and five different uh, relation types. Okay, and now I'm basically encoding all I know about uh, all the publications uh, ever published. Another example, especially um, that is extremely useful, is um, biomedicine, where again you have a lot of different entities, you know, from drugs to diseases, 
uh, adverse events, proteins, pathways, and you want to kind of encode this knowledge in a graphical form. So here we have different types of uh, relations like is a, so kind of hierarchical, associations between different things, a treatment that a given drug treats for a given disease, uh, uh, a drug may cause a adverse side effect of uh, migraine in this case, and you can kind of build this knowledge graph uh, scaffold that you can use as a, as a knowledge base over which you can then uh, reason or over which you can then learn. And there's many other uh, knowledge graphs that I'll, I'm going to show you later. For example, Google answers a knowledge graph when, when you type questions into the Google search box. Uh, same, same, up, same, same with Amazon. Amazon has a knowledge graph of all their products, their properties, sellers, and all that is in some sense uh, their no knowledge base. Like Facebook calls this the Facebook graph API if you want to access Facebook um, as a graph, right? If you look at Facebook, it's in, in a sense, it's not only people and their relationships, but also um, the, what, what schools people went to, what locations they attended. Uh, that's all nodes in this knowledge graph. It's all resolved to the level of entities. Um, uh, you know, and there are other um, examples of these technologies from IBM Watson to, to Microsoft has its own, they call it Satori, um, you know, LinkedIn, Yandex, and so on and so forth. And just give you one example of the application is for serving information, right? When you ask, uh, let's say here, Bing, right? What are the latest uh, um, films by the director of Titanic? They actually parse this, go, go to the, go to the, um, go to the, uh, go to the knowledge graph, uh, find the director, and then look at what is this director linked by, uh, by the relation that they directed, what movies they directed. And that's how they uh, retrieve, right? And usually if you think about um, uh, 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 question answering, let's say systems, if you think of Siri, if you think of Alexa, they are powered uh, by, the, by the structured knowledge in the, in the background, right? So Siri uses a humongous knowledge graph of the world's knowledge that when you ask it a question, the thing queries, right? And gives you the answer. And right here I'm showing you um, an example of a um, architecture of this kind of conversational uh, question answering uh, system where uh, you know where the the language natural language understanding is only a part of this and in particular what the key part is to take this language uh, parse it into a, a set of um, uh, candidates uh, that you are then retrieving from the knowledge graphs uh, and then returning back uh, to the user so that's kind of the key in this case so Today, right, we are going to talk about these uh, knowledge graphs. And if you think about general knowledge, knowledge graphs, then Freebase, Wikidata, DBpedia are examples of this, right? If you can take an entire Wikipedia and you can represent it as a, as a graph of uh, nodes and their properties and relations between them. Freebase is another example of this. This was, I think, a project that Google acquired a um, couple of years ago for, for, for a lot. I think, I think the, the price was, uh, was in billions, right? Um, and what is common characteristics to these things is that they are massive. They have millions of nodes, uh, millions of different edges and relations, and they are really incomplete uh, in a sense that no knowledge has not been completely mapped in these uh, knowledge graphs. Usually the reason there is two ways. One is we haven't entered all the knowledge in, uh, and the second, the second reason is we haven't yet discovered all the knowledge. If you think about biomedicine, biomedical knowledge graphs are incomplete because we don't understand fully the, bio, the let's say, human biology. So clearly there is information we are missing because we haven't discovered it yet. Versus uh, a knowledge graph like Freebase, I'll show you later, 83% of people that appear in Freebase as nodes don't have a, a year of birth, I think is the statistic, right? Because we haven't yet, nobody added that information in yet, right? So given what we'll be talking today about, um, um, uh, you know, kind of given a massive knowledge graph, enumerating all possible facts becomes intractable. But uh, what we would like to do is, the question is, can we predict plausible but missing links uh, in this knowledge graph? Or can we somehow embed nodes in the knowledge graph. To, to show you, right, I said earlier, a prominent example of knowledge graphs is Freebase. This kind of encodes knowledge about, you know, this kind of 
co uh, commonly known entities and uh, that appear in the world. It's about 80, 000, 80 million entities, 38,000 different relation types, right? So there is 38,000 different edge types and 3 billion edges, right? So because by the relation, so the point is it's not five relation types, it's 83,000 different relation types, right? So the world knowledge in this structured, uh, structured forum is, um, is, uh, is, um, is very complex, right? As I said, 93% um, of people in, that appear in freebase uh, don't have a place of birth um, and 80% don't have a nationality, right? So though there is no link relationship of that person, uh, nationality and to the, let's say, country uh, or nation mapped explicitly in this knowledge graph, yes? I guess when you're recording data in these knowledge graphs, is it preferable to have like proliferation of relation types, like lots of relation types, or is it more useful to have grouping of relation types from a learning perspective? Uh, good point. So what you are asking is to say, you have, like here I emphasized, you have this huge number of relation types, right? And the question is, is that too, is that too much? Um, what, should you, what, what should you do, right? I would say there is an entire, um, how to say, industry or an, an entire uh, field of, you know, how do you build ontologies? How do you build these knowledge bases? And it becomes very, very tricky. How do you, how do you bring any structure to these 38,000 different uh, relationships? And usually what would happen is that you would have them in some kind of hierarchy, if possible, where these relationships would get more and more fine grain, but still allows you to kind of reason between different uh, relationship types. So that becomes quite important. Um, in terms of publicly available data sets that people like to use, there is this Freebase 15,000, which is a graph on 50,000 entities, about between 200 and 1,300 different relations, and about 300,000 to 600,000 uh, different edges, right? So if you want a kind of a little academic benchmark, this is what, you know, new RIPs papers tend to use. But really, the full data set is up here. Very few papers kind of have the, have the guts to use the big data set because it's massive. Um, but that's the, that's the idea. So now what we will, so now let's talk, we talked about this knowledge graph um, kind of uh, uh, concept. Now let's talk about what is the knowledge graph completion task that people like to do. So a knowledge graph completion task is defined as follows. Given an enormous knowledge graph, the question is, can we complete it, right? So given, it's almost like a link prediction task, but it's a bit, it's a bit more nuanced. And the, this link prediction task for knowledge graph says, given a head and a relation type, predict me the missing tails, right? So it would be for a particular person, for a particular relation type, maybe born in, give me a, a list of places where that person might have been born. Because a single person can be born only in one place, I'd only take the top one, right? But in other cases, maybe it's be like visited, you know, tell me all the places that Napoleon visited. Then it'd be a ranking and somewhere I would, I would cut that, right? So um, one example of the task would be, you know, for the, uh, for the um, uh, predict the tail, right? Like you would predict science fiction for the head entity KJ, KJ Rowling. And the, and, and the genre relation is the, co the question is, what is the tail of this, of this query? It would be science fiction or it would be, I don't know, um, uh, youth literature or however you, wanna, however you wanna call it. So that's what we would like to be able to do. And as I said, it's a bit different than link, link prediction because I'm given the head and the relation type. So now, as I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, the way we are going to do this is we are going to learn a shallow embedding uh, of the nodes. So it means that for every node in the knowledge graph, we are going to learn its coordinates um, in a shallow way. So we will not be using GNNs, but we are kind of moving back to this idea of shallow embeddings, um, deep walks and, and, and uh, deep walk and uh, node to vec. But as you will see, we will not be using uh, random walks. So we'll just be using shallow embeddings. So in terms of um, uh, knowledge graph representation, the way we think of it is that it's a set of these triples, head, relation, tail. Um, and the idea is that we want to model entities and relations as embeddings or vectors in some Euclidean space, right? And we want to associate entities and relations 
with shallow embeddings, uh, right? As I said, no, no GNNs. The reason perhaps why no GNNs is because these knowledge graphs usually have no node features. Maybe you have a node type, but not more, right? So the, 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 all the information is in relations. So then the idea will be given a true triple head relation tail, the goal is to find the embedding for the head relation that is close to the embedding uh, of, the ta of the target, okay? So we'll be kind of talking about embeddings of, you, I will give you a head and I'll give you a relation, you will find, you will produce me an embedding of this thing, and hopefully the embedding of this thing will be close to the embedding of the target. So that the answer to this query is this target. That's, uh, that's, that's the hope, okay? So uh, the question then is, how do you embed this thing and how do you define closeness, okay? What is interesting, notice, right, I'm not embedding just a node, I'm embedding node comma relation and I'd like to, that this embedding node comma relation in the space is close to the answer to this, right? The correct thing has to be close to where the embedding of this uh, head comma relation is. So what we are going to do today is we are going to learn about different methods to pro produce embeddings of knowledge graphs as well as uh, the relations that are in them. These embeddings will be shallow, so we'll kind of work in the transductive uh, case. We are going to use different geometric kind of Euclidean geometry type intuitions. Um, and we are going to talk about different types of relationships that our embeddings will be able to, cap to capture. We'll talk about four different methods, transi, transar, distmult, and complex. It doesn't matter yet what they are, I'm going to define. It doesn't matter what exactly this means, but basically we are going then to look at different types of relations. We'll talk about symmetric relations, anti-symmetric relations, inverse relations, uh, composite relations, and one-to-end relations. I'm going to uh, explain this and we are going to see how different method is able to embed different types of relations. That's kind of how, what is going to happen and the rest of the lecture will be, will go through this table line by line and uh, you know we are going to kind of to fill in these uh, check marks and, um, and crosses uh, uh, for each of these things. So at the end basically this uh, table will be filled in and it will make, uh, it will make sense. So the first method I want to talk about is the first line of my table here is the, is the trend Z, okay? Um, are there any questions before we jump in? Yes. I mean, just based on our definition where we're taking the head, the relation, and then the target is like the thing we're trying to predict, it's kind of like saying that the graph is like, is like directed, right? Because we're always saying there's a direction from graph edge that already gives you directions toward a target. So uh, relation to that, right? Yes, you can, great point. So you are asking, is, is the graph directed? Yeah, you can think of it that it's directed, but if we are brothers, then I have a link brother to you, but you can also have a link brother to me, right? So, so yes, we are talking about directed graphs, but some relations can go both ways, as, as we are going to see, okay? So that will be one of the kind of properties uh, that we are going to talk about. Okay, super. So here is the, the, tra the trend Z um, intuition, and it's really about this translation intuition, right? Where the idea is for the triple head relation tail, um, I would like the following kind of in my, in my vector space, in my Euclidean space. I'd like H plus R to be kind of equal to T, right? Um, and uh, if the given facts are true, and otherwise I'd like this uh, to kind of uh, be different. Okay, that's the intuition. So the way, the way this would look like is to say the embedding of an H comma R is that I take the embedding of H, I have some embedding for R, so I move in this direction and hopefully I end up close to the target T. Okay, so I'll have an embedding for every relation, I'll have an embedding for every entity, so if this is a relation brother, then, and if this is me, then from me to brother, here should be all my brothers. And I know if there's a relation sister, then I'd go this way and here should be embedded all my sisters. Just as an example, right? Or, you know, if there's a relation Yure likes to eat, then there is a, I would learn, I know something down here and here would be all the dishes that Yure likes to eat, okay? So that's kind of the idea here, right? So the idea is that, you know, if I have an embedding of Obama, I have an embedding of nationality, so now I say, who, what is the nationality of Obama? I take this. 
I take the vector that I learned for nationality, I move in the space, wherever I land, this is where I want his nationality to be embedded. That will be kind of the objective function. Of course, it won't be spot on, but that's kind of the idea, right? So basically this means that we are going to learn embeddings of entities as well as the embeddings of relations or vectors for these relations with the goal that if I start at the head, I move in the direction of the relation uh, that is specified by the relation, I arrive at the target. And for people who have kind of NLP background, remember when we had this, um, I don't know, in, oh, some time ago, right, there were these word embeddings and, and, and people were so fascinated that if you take a king and move in one direction, you move to the queen. And uh, if you take, um, uh, um, and uh, you know, it was kind of consistent uh, for different kings and queens of all different world countries, kind of that vector in which you move was the same for them all. Or if you took a name of the country, and you looked where is the capital embedded, it was kind of the same direction from you know, China and Beijing, from uh, USA and Washington DC, for Germany and Berlin, it was all these kind of vectors. So that's kind of the one um, motivation uh, for this. Here's the algorithm, I throw pseudocode up, but the reason I wanna throw it up, uh, like show it here, is that I wanna show you that you basically, the way you learn this is in, in using a contrastive or triplet loss. Okay, so that's the concept I wanna teach you here. So the way we think of this is that basically we initialize the, the uh, embeddings of uh, um, uniformly at random of, um, of uh, entities and the relations. And then what I'm doing is I'm basically, um, uh, I need to create negative samples, right? For every triplet in, the, in, the, in, my, um, in my knowledge graph, head, relation, tail, I say, aha, uh -huh, for, for, a, for a given head and a given relation, the tail is a positive example, but the, uh, the real tail is a positive example, but now I need to find a, a, a negative example tail, right? And uh, now that I have a head, real tail, and a wrong tail, my goal in the objective function is that the distance between head plus relation to the real tail should be smaller than the distance from the head plus relation and the wrong tail. And then, of course, here you ask yourself, right, and this is called a contrastive loss that favors lower distance, higher score for valid triples versus, and ones who have high distance, um, lower, lower score for um, the corrupted ones, for the negative ones. And that's kind of the contrastive loss I want to explain here. Yes, question. Uh, yes, so in the in line 10 or team actually, whenever you sample your negative sample, uh, you have H prime as well as T prime, because that means you're sampling for both like a rock head and a rock tail, uh, because, yeah, like. Uh, good question. You can do it, you can do it both ways. You could say for the head relation, I want to get a correct tail and the wrong tail. The question is, what is the wrong tail? If you will pick a random entity, that will be a too easy tail. So what you usually want to do is you want to pick a tail that is of the same type, but wrong, right? So if I'm going from country capital, uh, sorry, country capital of and the, and the city, then I want the wrong tail to be a different city. I don't want the, the wrong tail to be a chocolate bar, right? That's it's e like th that won't work, right? It's too easy. So you want to be kind of careful how you do this uh, negative example sampling. But this is basically, you know, in some sense, yeah, great question. How do we handle transitive relations? Like uh, if you have a brother, then he's also your brother, but the vector only points in one direction. Great question. So the question is how do you handle uh, uh, transitive relations? Uh, let me get to that. We said we are going to fill in that table. That's exactly the question I want to address next. Next is right. What, what is this able to learn and where it's clearly going to fail? Okay? So um, now what we want to talk about is exactly what the question was about, right? Um, relationship in heterogeneous graphs have different properties. Some may be sym symmetric, like a brother or a roommate. I'm your ro roommate, you are also my roommate, right? It has to be that way if we are roommates. Um, uh, some may have uh, um, uh, uh, inverse relations, right? If I am your advisor, you are my ad advisee, right? So it's kind of uh, uh, that way. Um, this means that, you know, if one exists, the other one should also exist. So we can categorize this type of relationship patterns and ask, our knowledge, gra knowledge graph embedding method, like a trend Z, is it able, is it expressive enough to capture this type of patterns? Okay, so now 
what patterns of relations are we interested in. And here are the four I'll talk about. First one is symmetric or anti-symmetric relations that says if um, head and tail of are related by uh, relationship R and uh, then tail and head should also be related by relationship R. So this is like if we are, if I'm your brother, you are my brother as well, okay? And uh, anti-symmetric means if uh, H is related to T, then T cannot be related by H using the same relation, okay? Um, then you have inverse relations, which would mean that this is like advisor advisee type, right? Where whenever uh, H is an advisor of T, then T is an advisee of H, right? That's uh, uh, what we say an inverse relation. Uh, then we have composition or transitive relations, where you say if X and Y are of, uh, related by R1, and y and z are related by uh, R2, then uh, uh, x and z should be related by R3. Uh, so if you think of this, it's like um, if I'm someone's, uh, uh, someone's son and uh, they are, uh, and that person is someone else's daughter, then that person is, I don't know, my grandmother or something like that, right? Uh, I think I didn't say it well, but you see what I mean. It's like, Based on relationship, the third one is, uh, is determined. That's what we say, composition of relationships or uh, transitive relations. And then the last one is this one to n relations where um, you can have a case where the same head is in relation with many different tails. So it could be a case that I can have more than one, I can have more than one brother. So there could be many tails that satisfy this relation. Yes. Assume like one order for your operations, like because your husband's mother will be the same as your mother's husband. No, this assumes order. Okay. This assumes order. Okay. So let's now look what TrainZ allows me to do, right? Is it able to give me uh, to model uh, anti-symmetric relations, like hypernym type relations, right? And uh, uh, I, it can it can allow me uh, it allows me to do that, right? If H is in relation with T, then T cannot be in the same relation uh, with R, okay? So this, uh, this is uh, what this uh, allows me uh, to do. Um, it also allows me to model inverse relations by basically saying if H is related to T, then T can be related to edge according to this other relation, right? So it's just kind of a, a vector pointing in the opposite direction. So that, that I, can, uh, I can also do. I can also do composition, right, by saying if I can go from X to Y by R1 and from Y to Z by R2, then I can also learn a relation that goes directly from one uh, to the other. So these things are uh, naturally, uh, naturally, uh, naturally composable, right? Um, so this is in terms, uh, right, my mother's husband is my father or something like that, right? Um, so this is what we can... Uh, what we can what we can uh, uh, model, but here's an example we cannot that uh, of a relation that trans is not able to learn, right? Like a symmetric relation, like family, roommate, brother, and so on, right? Then I cannot model symmetric relations. The only way to model them is to embed H and T to the same spot and have R uh, R equal to zero, right? Then H plus uh, H plus R equals T and T plus R equals H. Right? That's the, that's the only way this would be, this would be possible. So we say that you cannot model uh, symmetric relations uh, with trans Z. Okay? So uh, that's the, uh, that's, that's one issue. And then another issue is that trans Z can also not model uh, one to N relations when it's kind of one to many uh, relations. Because the only way to, to model one to many would be that again, T1 and T2 have to be uh, uh, embedded at the same dot, at the same spot. So there is no distinction between these two entities, right? Like you only move in one direction um, and you cannot, um, uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, uh, do this because T1 into 2 will be mapped into the same vector even though they are different entities, okay? The, these are, um, these are the reasons, uh, you know, what trans Z can do and what trans Z uh, cannot do, okay? So, um, Based, based on kind of these uh, intuitions, failures of uh, uh, trans Z, I'll now show you a different method that uh, people have invented 
that will allow us to fix uh, some of these issues. Okay, so now we, we kind of completed the first line of that table and we are now moving uh, to, the, to the second line uh, of the table, which is the approach that, uh, that is called trans R. Um, right, and the way trans E models translation uh, of any relation uh, in the same uh, embedding space. And the question is, can we design a new space for each relation and do the translation in the relationship specific space? Okay, that's what trans R tries to do. So trans R is going to model entities as vectors in the entity space, but model each relation as a vector in the uh, relation space, right? Where um, R will be uh, k-dimensional, um, and uh, we will actually going to have then uh, a matrix that is going to map from this k-dimensional space back into the d-dimensional space in which the uh, entities are uh, embedded. So we are going to have this projection matrix. Uh, that's the idea for trans R, okay? So trans R models entities as vectors in the entity space that is d-dimensional and models each relation as a vector in the relation space um, with uh, M sub R being this, uh, this projection matrix that is uh, relation specific, right? Um, so the, the scoring function, so the way we are going to kind of measure the distance between uh, uh, head and tail for a given relationship uh, uh, R is, is the following, is we are going to um, apply uh, uh, relation specific uh, projection uh, uh, to the entity H, that's why I have it here. Uh, we are going to apply the same uh, uh, projection to the entity T, and then we are going to move according to the vector R. Okay, so here basically for every relation we are allowed to, to, um, to, uh, to kind of linearly uh, morph the space um, uh, uh, in a relation specific way, okay? So the idea is that, you know, maybe the entities uh, in the original space are embedded this way, but then our projection matrix is going to embed them differently, and then the relation embedding vector will tell me how to move from head uh, to the tail. That's the, that's the idea. So here I'm learning uh, three things. I'm learning the embeddings of entities. I'm learning the a relation vector R, and I'm learning the projection matrix uh, for every relation. That's the, that's the idea. So now let's reason about what this is going, uh, right? And just maybe in terms of how do I learn this, I basically use, this is my objective function, right? It's, it's essentially, it's an analogous to, uh, to the trend Z one, where we had the same, we said the, that the distance between uh, H plus R and T has to be small, um, but in this case, in this case, I'm using this uh, projection matrix. So it's essentially the same objective function that I'm trying to uh, that I'm trying to optimize. Just that I add uh, matrix M as part of the learning as well. So um, so now uh, what is interesting is that in this case, I may actually be able to model um, symmetric uh, symmetric relationships because uh, trans R will allow me to do this because uh, the matrix uh, M will allow me to uh, map from the two entities, from the space of entities uh, to the, to the kind of to the same spot in the relation uh, specific uh, uh, space. So this means that we can map H and T to the same location in the space uh, uh, of relation R um, and H and T are still different entities in the, uh, in the original space, right? So I can learn this type of mapping and uh, I will be able to handle symmetric relations, uh, the, the, something that trend Z uh, was not uh, able to do. I am uh, also able to handle um, anti-symmetric relations. This is actually the same as in uh, that trend Z can do, where, um, uh, um, you know, I can learn a, a projection that will kind of uh, keep the entities apart so um, I won't be able to come uh, uh, back to it, okay? So that's the same as what trend Z was able to do. 
Um, now, how about one to n relations, right? One to, n rela one to many relations means that one entity is related to many other entities according to the same relation. Uh, uh, again, um, uh, trends R will be able to do this because we can learn this projection matrix so that different targets, uh, different tails get mapped to the same point. So the idea is, right, if I in my original space I'll have H, T1 and T2, um, it is, it's possible to learn a, a projection matrix that maps both of them to the same point, point. so in this relation space, um, you know, now I said aha from H according to R, there's multiple entities here. Even though in the original space for some other relationship, I'm still able to distinguish these entities. Yes? Can you make a generalized point that if a uh, embedding method can handle symmetric relations, then it can handle one-to-one -one relations? So the question was, can you make a general claim that if a method can handle symmetric, uh, sorry, um, symmet yeah, symmetric relations, then it can handle one-to-many relations? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. My, my, answer, my answer would be no. Uh, but for a proof, maybe we can talk after the, okay? Good, thank you for the question. Yes? Uh, so why do we use just a linear transformation from the entity space to the relationship? Why don't we do like an MLP or something? Like Aha, uh -huh. good question. So the question is, why are we using a linear transformation? Why wouldn't we do um, a nonlinear? Um, a nonlinear transformation. Uh, I guess you could. Um, I mean, I think you could. You would learn an MLP that would basically take these coordinates and learn how to how to transform them. Um, you know, I'm trying to come up with a reason why that would be a bad idea. Um, it's a good. It's a good question. Um, my sense. Does anyone see why this would be a bad idea? Expensive. Yeah, I don't know. Like we could. You could see whether this is possible to learn. Now you are learning one kind of separate M MLP uh, uh, for like. It will be a very complicated learning loop because you will learn the embeddings of entities. Then you will want to learn the MLP. You'll want to learn the R. So it's a good question how, how you will, whether this will kind of work in practice, but if somebody gives you an MLP that works and the embeddings, yeah, I, there's no problem with that. But good, good question, I, you know, be fun to try. Um, cool, okay, so this is one too many. And then in terms of inverse relations, again, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is kind of uh, easy to see because it's trans R is just a generalization of trans E. So if the projection matrices for two uh, relations, uh, uh, two um, inverse relations is the same, then basically, you know, one relation vector is an inverse uh, of the other relation vector and you get this the same way we got it in, uh, in trans R, uh, in trans E, okay? And then the last thing to discuss is this uh, composition of relations. Um, and the way, the way perhaps uh, to see this um, is that uh, I'll give you some kind of visual proof or high level intuition why this, is, why this is possible. And the idea is that trends are models are triple with linear functions which are chainable, right? Kind of linear functions are composable so um, everything will work. That's the, that's the high level intuition. And uh, here, uh, here, here I have a, a, longer, um, a, longer, a longer proof that maybe in the interest of time that I, that I um, spent at the beginning talking about last year's uh, lecture that was slightly different, um, I will skip. But the way, the way you, can, you can do this is first you need to define this kernel space uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of a matrix. And then, you know, you can, you can say, aha, what is composition of relations? If, you know, if X and Y are related to, with R1 and Y and Z by R2, then I want to show that Y and Z according to R3 um, uh, is, is possible and basically you start writing it out according to our, uh, to our linear algebra with these projection matrices um, and then, um, and then, uh, and then that will, uh, uh, and then you can basically uh, define or come up um, with the answer that because you can, because these matrices are linear operators, uh, you can, you can chain them and get the correct answer at the end. Yes. 
vector spaces, like yeah. the space of entities and the space of relations, and all these rules are examining like injective, surjective, or bijective. Can I view it that way? Um, can you can you clarify? Like, can you ask again? <laughs> if this two, so basically, like the space of entities is R D, the yes. space of relations is R K. Yes. So it's just two vector spaces. Correct. Right. So therefore, we're looking at composition like of linear maps. Exactly, and it's a it's composition one, two, of linear maps across these two vector right. spaces. So then if it's 1, 2, n, that would be looking at if something's surjective, Correct. and then we can think about injective, or if it's bijective. Correct, you can, you can that's a, maybe another way to say it, is that basically you have two vector spaces, one is a d-dimensional, and I think the other one you said is a k-dimensional. Um, and uh, you are basically learning at looking at compositions across these two, and you are looking at this, as you said, bijective, surjective, uh, or injective um, uh, relationships across the space. So would that be related to the earlier two questions about um, what earlier earlier our friend asked? Um, if it's one to n, would it also be symmetric? That would mean just because it's surjective, it doesn't mean it could be bijective. Exactly. Right? Well, would that answer this question as well about the MLP because we're looking at um, like linear composition exactly. maps between, therefore you can't use MLP? Exactly, that's a great point. Actually, I was thinking of exactly the same. Um, uh, great observation, actually. So where your MLP would break is here, right? So that's, you would lose um, composition of relations with, uh, with, with the MLP. So that's that. That's the place it would break. So yeah, great, great part. Exactly, exactly. Cool. Uh, good. I continue. So this was um, uh, our second method that's uh, called Transar uh, and kind of defines these two uh, vector spaces uh, and kind of maps these projection matrices uh, uh, from one from one to the other. What I want to do next is talk talk about uh, the third method in this um, in this space called uh, this mult, okay? Um, and uh, this, here is, the, the idea behind this is this notion of bilinear modeling, right? So far, our scoring function was just a uh, Euclidean distance, or it was an L2 or L2 distance in this, uh, uh, between the, the embedding of the hat comma relation and the embedding uh, of the target, and we wanted to minimize that uh, distance. Um, uh, another line of work that kind of is, is a bit different is, is trying to adopt what, what, what is called uh, bilinear modeling. And in this mult, entities and relations uh, are using vectors uh, in uh, RK, but the scoring function that, uh, that uh, measures the distance between head and tail according to the relation R um, will have the following form, where you are going to basically go over uh, uh, the individual coordinates of H uh, R and T, multiply them together and sum them up. So the way the way you can uh, you can uh, uh, think of this is that basically you have the head, you have a relation, you have a head and a tail, you have a relation, you you multiply these things together, coordinate wise, and sum them up, and that is your score. Okay. So now we defined um, we defined a different scoring function, um, and we are still going to have a head relation and a tail. Uh, embedding as we had it in uh, trend Z, just the scoring function is now different, right? So um, the intuition for the scoring function is that it can be viewed as a cosine similarity between uh, H uh, times R um, and T, where uh, in our case H times R um, would be uh, defined as a, as a summation uh, of uh, H sub I and uh, R, R sub I. Right, so the idea would be that basically, um, if you have um, if you have your uh, target t two and you have your target t one, then um, you can you can basically uh, think of uh, uh, of the um, of this vector a h times r, um, and when you multiply it with t, that's basically coordinate ways wise. Um, uh, 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 multiplication uh, and uh, and a summation. Okay, so that's the way um, to uh, uh, to think of this. So let's now look at um, what this this mult uh, allows you to do. So let's first look at one-to-many relations. So here I have 
had relation tail one, had relation tail two. Um, and you know, can, can this MULT uh, uh, model this? Um, it basically um, can because um, it, can, it can put uh, tail one and tail two um, in such a way that basically the, the cosine uh, uh, distance um, between, between this, uh, these vectors um, uh, will, be, um, will, be, uh, will be equal, okay? So that's the, that's the, first, uh, the first thing. The second thing is to go and ask about symmetric uh, relations. Here, you know, this is again this brother type uh, relation. The way this mult can, uh, 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 can, naturally, can naturally do this is because basically our, um, our um, scoring function um, is the same regardless of uh, head and tail, right? So basically multiplication is, uh, um, um, uh, uh, you know, the order uh, the order in which I multiply numbers uh, doesn't matter, right? So I'll get the same score if I'm scoring head relation T or if I'm scoring tail relation uh, head. So I will naturally uh, get that. Of course, because I get this property, I then um, cannot get the uh, anti-symmetric property because this mult cannot model anti-symmetric uh, relations, right? Because the score of head relation tail is the same as score of uh, tail relation head, uh, uh, this means uh, um, uh, the, the, the uh, score of head and tail and the score of uh, tail and relation will always be the same, so you cannot uh, distinguish, uh, distinguish the two, right? So you cannot say if head is in relation R with tail, then tail cannot be in the same relation with uh, uh, with R, that will, you know, it will always uh, be symmetric. It won't be able to, to capture this type of anti-symmetry. Um, and then the same, the same thing is with inverse relations where you would want to be able to enforce relationships where, where if head is in relation uh, R2 with tail, then tail is in relation of uh, R1 uh, with the head. And again, because of this uh, argument on the previous slide, uh, this mult won't be able to model this type of relations because uh, if it does model inverse uh, relations, then it would mean that R1 uh, and R2 have to be the same, have to be kind of the same vector. But semantically, this does not make sense because embedding of advisor should be kind of, shouldn't be the same or uh, should be different than the embedding uh, of the advisee. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about modeling inverse relations. Um, and the last thing I want to uh, address is the notion of composition uh, of relations, okay? So here the question is, can I learn, can this mult learn patterns where this kind of R1, uh, you know, composition or transitive relations? Um, and the intuition here is that this mult defines a hyperplane uh, for each uh, head relation pair. And the union of hyperplanes induced by the um, multi-hop relationship across multiple uh, relations cannot be expressed uh, as a single hyperplane, right? So you cannot kind of compose these uh, hyperplanes uh, step, step by step and maintain, the, and maintain the hyperplane. So you won't be able to learn this kind of compositions where you can go uh, um, or, or um, transitivities uh, across uh, relationships, okay? So, um, this is, and I have a de detailed, um, detailed derivation um, um, uh, here, here, here as well, where basically what we are going, the, the, um, the, um, what you are basically able to show is that the, the composition of, you know, two relationship cannot be expressed uh, using uh, a single, uh, a single hyperplane. And the uh, detailed derivation uh, will go, would go in the following way, that we would pick some y uh, such that the scoring function of x, y according to relation one is greater than zero. And then, for example, um, let's call this uh, y2. And then we are going to say that then y2 times some other relation r is kind of going to define the new um, hyperplane. And then we will be, uh, observing um, what is uh, what is happening um, as we now uh, pick uh, another uh, in our case another 
um, uh, y such that the relation y and that y is greater than zero. Let's call this uh, y uh, y3, and then y times the relation two will define the new um, the new the new hyperplane. Okay, and then basically now if you have the two hyperplanes defi divide, uh, defined by y2 and uh, y3, and now you know combining them um, together uh, for you know for all uh, z's that are in this uh, uh, shadow uh, shadow area, um, there uh, you know the question is does there exist y uh, between this y2 and y3 such that the score of y and z according to the relation uh, two um, is uh, greater uh, greater than uh, greater than uh, greater than zero, right? And uh, what you are uh, going to find is that you know for that basically you cannot um, you cannot uh, find uh, find um, uh, 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 such uh, such a case where this would be um, where this would be possible, right? So a way to look at it is that basically according to the composition of uh, relations, we would also want the score according now to R three between x and z. Right to be greater to be greater than zero. Right for every z that is in this um, uh, shadow area. Right, but this is this inherently cannot be cannot be done uh, or expressed as a single hyperplane defined by uh, x and R three, uh, no matter what R three is. Right. So basically, this means that in this uh, um, uh, this mult, you are not able to express a transitive. Uh, transitive relations. Um, this is quite interesting because this this mult, as I'm going to show you later, um, some people like in some knowledge graphs it works really well. So it becomes you know a good question: um, what kind of method to apply to a given domain or to a given uh, knowledge graph? Yes, a question. Uh, the key difference between this method we're learning and trans R and trans A seems to be the scoring. Exactly. Uh, function, and that seems to then imply why we can't have this composition, why there's a limitation of the composition. Is there a way to pick a scoring method such that it has many of the beneficial properties of this without the drawback of uh, composition being unavailable? Great. So it's a good, uh, so first I'll repeat your question and, uh, um, and also your observation. So observation is that basically um, what we are doing here, this is very similar to our trend Z method, right? We are learning an embedding of every every entity and every relation, but what we changed was the scoring function, right? In the trend Z, our scoring function was the distance between H plus R and T. Uh, here, our scoring function is this product of uh, product and sum of these uh, coordinates. And because we changed the scoring function, uh, we get certain properties for free while uh, losing uh, other properties. Um, as I think you are going to see at the end in the final table, um, it's actually the trans R that checks the most of those check, check marks, right? Where we were learning these projection matrices between the, the, two, uh, the two vector spaces. Um, that's, that's what I would say about this. Yes? Short question. So we were talking today mostly about the transductive setting for most of this learning. Yes. But let's say in real world application, we saw these, these are massive, 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 massive networks. So don't we want to basically find a method that we can do on a small part of the network so we can generalize? So let's say trans R, we need the, we will need the M matrix for all of these entries, right? So that would be a non-computationally feasible matrix. Good question. So the question is, uh, you know, uh, these methods are transductive. It means we have to learn an embedding for every for every entity separately. Won't this be computationally uh, expensive? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, the the I would say from, from the one reason why transductive is okay is because these graphs we don't think of them as dynamic we don't think of this as data we think of this as as knowledge in some sense and and you know the f set of entities is kind of fixed the set of relationships is also fixed and you are trying to infer let's say the edges you are trying to embed the the entities according to the uh, to the relationships across. Uh, 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 in, in which they are. So actually, in terms of scalability, this is challenging, but it's not that challenging, 
because you can kind of distribute these entities uh, across different machines. And there is a very nice uh, package uh, open sourced by Facebook called uh, Big Graph. If you just Google that on GitHub, you can basically get, uh, get a system that will allow you to embed essentially arbitrarily knowledge graphs. And internally, Facebook, let's say, was using this, this, this type of technology to embed all the entities in their knowledge graph and use that for recommendations. So people have put immense resources and energy to be able to scale this up uh, to the Facebook scale. Uh, and then they open source. So you can do this and a lot of people when they want to pl start playing in industrial settings with kind of graph machine learning use cases, the first thing would do to, would be to use this uh, big graph package uh, that's, that's on Facebook, uh, on GitHub. Okay, cool. Uh, that answered the question? Okay, great. Thank you. Super. So now um, we, the, last, the last method today and then, uh, and then wrap up. And this method that I want to talk today the last one is called complex, right? And uh, it's based on this smooth, um, com but complex is going to embed uh, entities and relations in the complex vector space, right? So not in the real, but in the, in the complex, right? Um, so now the way um, you can think of this and what you are uh, getting, what you are getting when you are in the, in the complex space, you get this notion of, a, of the complex conjugate, right? If I have, a point uh, in the in the uh, with a complex embedding that has the the real uh, and the imaginary uh, axis. Then there is also exists a, um, a a conjugate of that point where basically if I had before a plus b uh, i, now I have uh, a minus uh, b i. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the uh, what you get here um, uh, when you think about. Uh, complex, uh, complex arithmetics and trying to think about how would I embed um, things in the complex space, right? So here, um, the, way, the way we think of this is uh, U is a, is a point in the complex space and the way it's, it's def the position of it is defined uh, in two ways, is defined by the um, embedding of A and it's de defined by the embedding of B uh, and both are k-dimensional, okay? So that's the way, um, that's the way uh, to think of this. Uh, but of course, what is going to uh, work differently is now the scoring function. And the way the scoring function is going to work is that, uh, is that now I'm going, when I'm doing my, um, uh, my scoring function is going to be defined this way, right? So I'm going uh, to multiply h and r, but I'm going to multiply that with the conjugate of uh, t. And then whatever is the result, I'm only going to take uh, the real part uh, of that. And that will be my, uh, my, uh, my example of the score uh, for a given relation, head uh, and the tail. Okay, that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the idea of how complex uh, is going to work. Okay, so um, now let's go and look what this will allow us to model. First, let's look at uh, uh, anti-symmetric relations. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the claim is that complex can model anti-symmetric relations. Um, and uh, the, the idea is that, you know, the model is expressive enough to be able to learn a high value of the scoring function uh, for uh, uh, when, you, when you are uh, uh, multiplying h uh, and, uh, and the conjugate of t and a low uh, value of the function where you are multiplying t with the conjugate uh, of H, okay? So due to the symmetric uh, modeling uh, of using uh, complex uh, conjugate, right? So this, is, this means that we will be able to model um, complex, uh, um, complex relationships. Uh, how about sym symmetric relationships, right? Uh, roommate, brother, and so on. You are able to do, uh, to do that as well. And here I have a bit of, uh, a bit of algebra, right? So you are asking what's the score between of R, H, and T is, and is that the same as the score of R, T, and H? And you can, uh, the way you can, um, you can uh, uh, derive this is to say, oh, this is the real of this product. You can uh, take the product, uh, you can take the product uh, out. You can then take uh, R, um, which is uh, which is a, a 
uh, a, re uh, a, a real vector and uh, just take the, the real of the, of the H and T, which are, which are, which are uh, complex. Um, if you, if you uh, uh, do it this way, then uh, you can move uh, the, uh, the conjugate from T to H uh, as well, and then basically expand it back uh, to get the embed to get to the scoring function of t comma h. So the key the key step is this step where you basically the, is the equivalence from here uh, to here, and then it's just expanding it back to to uh, what the scoring what the scoring function is. So this is for uh, showing uh, symmetric relations. Um, last, what is interesting about complex is that you can also do inverse uh, inverse relations. And the way you can do uh, inverse relations is that uh, R and um, uh, that R1 is just a conjugate of uh, R, is a complex conjugate of R, uh, uh, of R2, right? And the idea here is, right, is in this kind of, um, uh, when we talked about cosine, uh, cosine uh, distance or cosine similarity where, um, where 90 degrees is exactly the angle um, at which uh, things are at the, at, the, at, the maximum, at the maximum distance. And that's why um, this, is, uh, this is the case here. And if you think about, if you go back to my original picture, right, what kind of the, the angle between these two vectors, vectors of u and the conjugate of u is also um, 90 degrees, right? And the dot product between these two guys uh, will, be, uh, will be zero, if you think of it in the, in kind of the, the Euclidean way. Okay, so that, that's the reason about uh, inverse relations. And then the last thing I wanna talk is about composition, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, one-to-many relations. And here basically I can just say that complex shares the same property uh, with this smooth. You cannot model compositional relations and you cannot model uh, one-to-many uh, relations using it. So now, to bring everything together and kind of summarize it, here is a one slide summary of today's lecture of different methods. What, uh, the, how do these methods differ? These methods differ on how the embedding is determined. Is it determined, um, you know, the, are we embedding H, T, and R in the real space? Uh, are, like this was in trans Z. In trans uh, R, we had H, T, and R uh, embedded in, um, uh, in, embedded in, actually H and T were embedded in D-dimensional, R was embedded in um, um, uh, uh, D-dimensional, and then we had the, the projection matrix that mapped from the uh, entity space to the relation space. And then for this mult uh, and complex, we, um, in this mult we used uh, the embeddings that were in the reals. For uh, complex, we used the embeddings that were in the complex space, and then the scoring functions uh, uh, we were using are, were different, right? For trans Z, it's a simple, let's say here, Euclidean distance, the L2 norm between hat plus relation minus tail. So basically the distance between uh, the hat plus relation and the tail. Um, in the trans R, we had these projection matrices involved, but it's still, let's say, Euclidean distance. In this mult, we defined the, we find, we defined this uh, kind of notion of uh, cosine distance. And in complex, uh, we, we changed further the definition. We kind of adopted the dismult distance function, but added the, the um, uh, 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 we extended it uh, in the following way. And then what was different, right, is that we looked at this symmetric, anti-symmetric inverse uh, composite, or also called transitive relations and one-to-many relations. And this is how different methods compare to what they are able to, uh, to what kind of relations uh, they are able uh, to model. Uh, that's what I wanted to say, and I am also going to um, to have a few more slides with practical tips. But I'm happy now to take questions. Oh yeah, I had a question about the anti-symmetric case for complex. Uh -huh. um, is there like a complex conjugate interpretation for proving that that one works? Just felt like for symmetric and for inverse, that was a really nice complex conjugate interpretation. But I didn't get that for anti-symmetric case. Uh, good point. Why don't we? Why don't we then go back and look at it together after the lecture? Okay. Good.
anything else people would like to ask? Um, if not, let me just uh, a, f uh, a few more things to say. So the, in practice, right, like I, I gave you these methods and you're like, it's clear what I should be using. It has all the check marks, beautiful. Um, you know, it seems this mult you shouldn't really be using. Uh, has the most, uh, captures the list of these properties and so on. But actually, you know, the, the, the real world is a bit more, um, is a bit more complicated. And it actually turns out that different knowledge graphs will have very different, drastically different uh, relation patterns, kind of prop relations with different properties. So generally, there is kind of not a one best embedding that works for all, <coughs> all, um, all different, uh, uh, all different knowledge graphs. So many times it's good to actually go into the knowledge graph, see what are the types of relationships you have, try to quantify them, understand them, and then, um, and then choose your uh, method. What people like to use is usually first run trend Z because it's so simple and so easy. It's kind of the easiest to learn, the easiest to, to, uh, to make stable. Um, it's kind of the, the very natural, very interpretable, very easy to try. So people would usually start with uh, trend Z. Um, and then, you know, you can move, uh, um, you can move to more uh, complex, uh, complex uh, 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 models like um, complex, rot AD, uh, dismult, um, and, uh, and so on. Um, Transy is going to work well, especially if the, your, tar, your graph doesn't have too many symmetric uh, relations, okay? Um, so kind of to summarize uh, today's lecture, we talked about link prediction or knowledge graph completion as one of the uh, important tasks in this field of knowledge graph uh, embeddings. We talked about definition of, an, of a knowledge graph and how knowledge graphs are being used to uh, serve information, but that knowledge graphs are extremely incomplete um, and, pe and people uh, usually want to complete them, make them more robust. Um, what is also a very useful way to use a knowledge graph is that you can use it as a scaffold for some external nodes to connect to it and then learn a GNN that, you know, goes uh, between your data graph and between your background knowledge graph. This is especially very useful in uh, biomedical applications where you have the background biomedical knowledge graph of your, um, of your biological entities, but maybe then you have a patient node that links to different parts of the knowledge graph. And then you can start thinking about learning, um, let's say GNNs that are going to go from patient down to the knowledge graph, propagate across the knowledge graph and go back to the patient and do this kind of triangular information passing. And that's a very effective way how you can, let's say, reason about patients by exploiting the background knowledge, the background knowledge graph that you have about uh, human biology. So. That's maybe one way to think about is that knowledge graphs are very helpful either to serve information and then you want to use these embeddings to complete them. Sometimes people apply this knowledge graph embedding techniques also to their data graphs. I mentioned the example of, uh, of uh, Facebook and the big graph uh, package they developed. Um, but I think when these things work also really well is when you bring your, you know, your data entities and connect them with your background knowledge, your knowledge graph entities. This, this example of patients and, uh, you know, underlying uh, biomedical knowledge graphs uh, being, being an example. Uh, today we talked about, you know, the, the, the lecture today was, was quite dense and we talked about four different methods, kind of trans that, uh, that's easy and natural. We talked about trans R that's a bit more advanced, but based on the same um, same intuition and then this mult and complex that kind of changed this uh, uh, scoring function uh, and they all use kind of different embedding spaces and they have different um, uh, uh, expressiveness. But so this is what I wanted to show today and then next week um, on Tuesday I'm actually going to uh, kind of enrich uh, this notion of how do I do link prediction in knowledge graphs? And we'll talk about this kind of multi-hop link prediction or basically being able to reason and answer arbitrary queries 
our incomplete knowledge graph. So we will be given an, a, a knowledge graph and a logical query, and the question will be, can you find all the entities that satisfy that logical query? Um, that's what we are going to uh, learn uh, about on Tuesday. Um, you know, let's finish here, but if people have questions, please come, come here and we can, uh, we can talk. Uh, thank you so much.